Good morning, everybody. Good morning, members. It's Thursday, April 4th. Quorum is present. The Minnesota Senate Education Finance Committee will now come to order. We have two, four, five bills before us today. The first two are Senator Gustafson's. The first one is Senate File 3449. Whenever you're ready, Senator. And we will be laying this bill over. Thank you. I had to get my glasses. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I have two bills before you today. I know the first one we're doing is Senate File 3449. Um, but when it comes to education funding, we need to boost funding across the board for all schools and do our part to make sure schools on the bubble between urban and rural areas have a fair shot to catch up as well. Bottom line, even with historic funding of last session, we haven't been able to undo the damage of grossly underfunded schools for the last 20 years. These two bills are part of the next steps in trying to make sure our schools and our students get the resources they need. 3449 adjusts the formula allowance, resulting in higher per pupil amount to all eligible students. Um, one of my superintendents, I believe, is here to testify whenever you're ready. Mr. Chair? We are ready. Welcome to the committee. You, we have three testifiers. You're signed up. So identify yourself for the record and make sure you... Is the sign-up sheet up there, Senator? Um, yes, it is, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. you. Yeah, make sure everybody signs in and identify yourself and begin whenever you're ready. First up is um, Matt Groves. Great. Good morning, Chair Kunish and members of the committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today, and thank you, Senator Gustafson, for introducing this bill. My name is Matt Gross. I'm the superintendent for the Grand Rapids and Big Fork Public Schools. We serve about... 4,000 students covering an area larger than the state of Delaware in northern Minnesota. This is my 20th year as an administrator, 18th as a superintendent, and reflecting on today, I realize that I've cut budget in the spring more than I haven't, including every year that I've been in Grand Rapids. It's involved closing schools, eliminating programs, and laying off teachers, principals, and support staff. Making budget reductions has become a normal part of my job, even though that's the furthest thing from why I became an educator or a superintendent, which is to provide opportunities uh, for students for hope, happiness, and success. School funding, as Senator Gustafson uh, referenced, has been playing catch up for 20 years, and many districts have filled in that gap with operating referendums. After five years of budget cuts, our operating referendum failed in November three to one. After this year's reductions, we'll have cut 15% of our operating expenses, which has meant over 40 teaching jobs, 75 jobs in all in the last five years. Those reductions have included things like art and music and Spanish, but also things like math teachers, English teachers, science teachers, social studies teachers, elementary teachers. We've got coaches, we've got principals, we've got directors, we've got support staff. We're shifting our grade level arrangement at our elementaries for the fall in order to manage cuts, keep class sizes as small and equitable as we can, and position ourselves for future reductions. As a superintendent, what makes this situation especially painful is I see the gaps. I see the gaps between what my colleagues are able to offer students and families in districts that have more funding. My students in my district and actually my own children have less than these students in other districts just because of where they happen to grow up. I see gaps between students in my own district, students who graduated just five years ago and students who will graduate this spring. There's gaps. Uh, the course book looks different and I have students in eighth grade sitting in study halls two hours a day because we can't afford elective classes. And that's hard for me to say as a superintendent, it's hard for me to stomach. Uh, it's hard for me as a parent as well. I want more and I want better for our students. Uh, my students here uh, in northern Minnesota aren't less valuable, but they're treated that way in our system in Minnesota because of when they happen to grow up and where they happen to grow up. <clears throat> and that's not okay. And no Minnesotan should be okay with that. Last spring has been described as historic state funding, and I can understand how some people can see in that way, and I'm grateful for the funding that came on the formula and the work that was done on the special education cross-subsidy, so thank you for that. But as a superintendent, I do see last year as a missed opportunity, and not just because superintendents have a reputation for always wanting more. I just don't believe that when we're playing catch-up to inflation or the job market, that mandates, whether they're funded or they're not, um, are helpful. Having money being put in one pocket only to have it taken out of the other pocket is not helpful. 
That's why this bill is really, really important. It puts money on the formula. It helps close the budget deficit in my district, meaning less cuts, building towards stability and opportunities for students. I believe in our public schools. I believe in our teachers. I believe in our principals. I believe in our superintendents and our school boards in our state. And I believe they know what their communities need. Last spring, on the heels of the school funding bill being passed, I heard elected officials say that last year was a start, but that we can't make up for 20 years of underfunding in one session, just like Senator Gustafson referenced. And I respect that. What I'm asking is that you build on last year, keep education a priority, and support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. And I, I just want to say that um, we are playing, we are playing catch up after decades of underfunding schools. And uh, a surplus such as last year isn't going to fix everything in one year. And funding education in the best way possible is certainly one of our priorities. Uh, when we talk about mandates, that's what we do here at the legislature. Every single bill, everything that we enact is a mandate. It's a law. It's an expectation. And so um, we are working and doing the best that we can with what we have. Um, and it certainly isn't a, um, an issue of... Um, prioritizing one district over the other. But thank you so much for joining us today. Next we have uh, John Vento, Director of Robbinsdale Area School Board. My, my, oh, I'm, you're going next? I'm okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Chair Kunish. Um, again, my name is John Vento. I'm a current board member and the current treasurer of Robbinsdale Area Schools. And I'm speaking today on behalf of my district and behalf of the uh, Minnesota School Board Association. I want to thank Senator Gustafson for introducing 3449, and I'm here obviously in support. Last year, MSBA and a lot of districts asked for five and five on the formula. We ended up at four and two. We also saw reductions in the EL and special ed cross subsidies, but we all still know, as we just heard, that the funding is still lagging behind inflationary increases since 2003, and roughly, I think it's about $1,800 still short. In Robbinsdale, we have settled all of our union contracts over the last two months with significant increases for the teachers, educational assistants, AFSCME, and nutrition service staff. Using the funding that we have from last year, which was, in my time, yes, historic, but still lagging. Most of those resources have been, went to our staff, the frontline folks helping our students learn every day. Despite all of that, Robbinsdale is facing a $17 million shortfall this year. Now everyone might say, where did the money go? Well, despite the funding from last year, Robbinsdale, you know, we all know the ESSER money is coming to an end. So you've got a shortfall there. We have declining enrollment in Robbinsdale. And during the pandemic, we held our staff harmless from the, that declining enrollment. So we lost about 1,100, 1,200 students. We had a reduction only of 10 staff, licensed staff members during the same period of time. And then the inflationary increases that everyone has experienced across the state are still impacting budgets today. We're in the process, of, again, of reducing $17 million right now to share a high level because we've not finished our budget for next year to share with staff. So I'm aware of some things, but not all the details of it but approximately we're gonna be cutting 35 positions in our central office, which equates to about 23% of central office staff. In our buildings, the people who are helping our students the most, there's gonna be about 121 positions eliminated. That roughly estimates to about 10%. And then buildings and supplies, services and things, another 15%. And that comes to 17 million. With the increase of just 2%, with uh, Senate File 449, we estimate that would give Robbinsdale about 1.6 million different. And I wanted to just clarify that there were some runs that I was given yesterday. Those numbers are using this year's student count, not what we're rejecting for next year. So the estimate my administration is using is lower than what MDE says we might be getting. We are trying, and that will be roughly 9%. We're trying to do as much to keep these reductions away from any staff that are supporting our students, much as we did during the pandemic. And the additional 2% will help us accomplish a little bit of it. We realize it's not gonna fix it all. I know overall, you know, the metro area, I've seen roughly $300 million in cuts coming this year. 
So despite the historic funding, we also have the reality of what happened with ESSER. We have the reality of um, holding our staffs and our buildings harmless through the pandemic, and now it's come true. And we just are asking for any additional resources that you guys can approve in this 2%, would it be some assistance to us in offsetting things and helping us accomplish you know, better education opportunities for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent. And I'm only a board director. Or director, excuse me. <laughs> I'm, I'm got mixed up going, running between things this morning. Um, but yes, thank you very much for uh, sharing that. It's, um, I know it's a hardship, and I know what Robbinsdale has been going through for almost a decade now. That was the school district that I taught in for 20, 25 years. Um, our budget this year is $45 million. And in order to do that 2%, it would be over $158 million. And, and we hear you and we understand you. There's nothing I would love more than to wave a magic wand and, and have all that money to go to the schools and um, ensure that the teachers and the students have what they need, but also that we don't have to close schools when the enrollment declines, that it's the school that we're looking at um, to house our children in. So thank you very much for coming and, and sharing that with you so much. Um, Miss, next we have Superintendent <laughs> Jeff Holmberg from Centennial Schools. Please go ahead, introduce yourself, and you may begin. Good morning, Chair Kunish and uh, committee members. My name is Jeff Holmberg, Superintendent of Centennial Schools, and I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 3449. Thank you, Senator Gustafson for uh, introducing this bill. Um, I really echo the previous testimony that uh, came before you today. Um, and I'm also gonna speak to a little bit of a, a different approach that I shared uh, with the uh, legislators that represent Centennial School District, which is Senator Gustafson as well as Senator Kroon. And uh, after last year's legislative session with the four and two, I did share a letter of thanks and appreciation for the funding that did come to school districts. As a result of the legislative session and according to the E-12 summary funding, Centennial Schools received about $881 per pupil unit uh, per, based on ADM. And that resulted in about $5.6 million to our school district. Um, that is truly indeed great funding with the, for, with the, with the um, funding that came from last year. As a district, the much needed funding we invested in our learners and in our staff. We were also able to uh, settle our contracts with all of our bargaining groups um, and focus that to be able to help them and make the necessary investments in our staff, in our classroom to the extent possible. Last year I also advocated and um, testified on behalf of the five and five. Uh, the two percent in the second year does limit our ability to continue to make investments in the educational programs that our students desperately need. As you referenced earlier, um, the mandates, the legislative priorities that come out of the legislature and are approved into law, districts are at the helm of putting those in place for their students and for their stakeholders. And those are very good educational priorities that come from the state. What we're asking for is the additional funds to be able to support those and be able to implement those to the best of our ability. And that does come with the request for additional funding. As a school district, by comparison, um, Centennial ranks 307 out of 329 Minnesota school districts in funding received from the last legislative session. Put simply, this disparity in funding for Centennial res uh, restricts our school district's ability to meet the statutory and legislative requirements and limits the programs and experiences that we can bring forward to our students. So with that, I also urge this committee and co to continue to have this conversation for additional funding for our schools. Um, we extend gratitude for your commitment to addressing these vital issues and look forward to the future of this legislation's positive impact on school districts and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent um, Holmberg. Members, are there any questions or comments? Senator Swadzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the le I, I think this was for the second speaker. I'm not sure. Um, 
So one of the three of you, I have two questions. One of the three of you mentioned mandates. And if, and the chair ref made a comment that she, if she wishes she had a magic wand, and we all do, believe, believe us, please, um, as, especially, well, all of us do on this committee. But when we hear the word mandates, I, I want to come back and just go, if you had magic wand and magic dust, we can't keep hearing about unfunded mandates in plurals and not be told or suggested one in particular. And that would be helpful because, you know, when I go door knocking and I meet people and I say, you know, I'm, what I'm doing and I'm running for public office and um, the, one of the things that they complain about is all the regulations upon their business or companies or whatever. And I'll say, well, what regulations are you uncomfortable with or do you want change? And they never come up with anything. They've, they've just say regulations. And so when... I hear mandates, I want to know what mandate, pick one out of the allegedly, allegedly 64 that we keep hearing about from last session. So if you could pick, or any of the three testifiers, one in particular that you feel would help, help the kids, the students, and the teachers, what one would you pick? Thank you. And I do have another question. Okay. Uh, Who would like to start there? I'll start. If I, I'm okay to start. All right. John uh, Vento. Be careful, but better not be any of my bills. <laughs> well, I'm not promising that. Director uh, Vento. Thank you, Chair Kunish, and thank you for the question, uh, Senator Swadzinski. Um, again, John Vento, Robbins Hill Area Schools. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach, because if I had the wand, it'd be enrollment, plain and simple, because everything is tied to enrollment for funding. So if I could stem the loss of students, and if I look back through the pandemic versus going back and looking at data from the late two, uh, 20 or the 20, 2008, excuse me, we regained students after the recession. We've not regained students. When the students that left during the pandemic are not coming back. They made choices, districts made choices, whether to mask, whether to close. There is a fundamental shift, and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of districts across the state that are affected by that, that we lost enrollment numbers, they went private, they went charter, they went home school. Those students are not and did not come back. So there's that one side of it there. But if I'm gonna look at a mandate that came in, and this is a mandate I support 120% because my district was a leader on this in the state of Minnesota besides Alexandria, the READ Act. Back in 2019, Robbinsdale started to invest in the science of reading and made those investments after we passed a referendum in 2018, intentionally using that money to invest in the science of reading and the changes there. We were not reimbursed in the current bills. We're not gonna have a chance to get reimbursed because it was too long ago. Alexandria took the lead. We invested in our staff, did the PD, ex no worries, accelerated that PD during the pandemic using the ESSER funds. You guys passed the READ Act last year, 120% I support it. Because that's what we were, the move, we were moving to Robbinsdale. Now we have to pay for PD through MDE and my, my team my administration is working very hard with MDE right now to say, no, we've done the training. We don't need to get retrained. How is that certification going to work? Our initial estimate is next year an additional $800,000 in training for teachers that might have already went through the training for Robbinsdale. On top of that, we now have to buy new curriculum because the science reading curriculum didn't exist in 2019. It was balanced literacy still. So we invested in the best tool that we had available but today, that now is not on the approved list, so we're next year going to have to spend another $1.5 to $2 million on curriculum to get up to speed. Again, I fully support the READ Act, and I love that, you know, as I know I've heard from, you know, READ.2 or READ.8, whatever the variant is. I'd take funding there just to make us whole. And the $1.6 million that we're short just based on this 2%, at least I could maybe cover curriculum with that, but I'd rather try and hold on to some teachers or EAs and support staff for our students. So, I mean, we're, we're constantly in that struggle, and we have been. And I don't think, I, I think I can speak for most districts in the state. I understand the disparities in greater Minnesota, not having the tax base to be able to get the referendums, what's going on with local optional, all of it. 
So I can go down many rabbit holes of any mandates that I've worked with over the last 11 years as a school board member, but right there's one specific that I support, that I would, would love to see, you know, would gonna love to see implemented and see what those results are for our students, so. Thank, thank you, and um, just so that you know, we are trying to get some help to you guys for those, that Very curriculum. Very that too. <laughs> um, and I do believe Superintendent Gross wanted to make a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, like the board, uh, the board member uh, from Robbinsdale, fully support the READ Act. I think that's a great educational leadership decision by the state. Um, I, a couple examples that I would speak to. One is unemployment for nine-month employees, and I know that the state invested money to help pay for that one time. But when we talk about funding, sometimes it's about where money goes and where it doesn't go. In that case, we're putting money, we being the state, are putting money to pay for people that aren't working. And if that money were to be invested on the formula, for instance, we could be using that money to pay for people that are. And I'm not sure how we're gonna settle our next contract uh, with any meaningful raise for our teachers and our support staff, the ones that are working. And so that's an example of a choice that was made um, to, fund, to fund one thing, but as a result, we're unable as a state to fund something else. Uh, another one is uh, earn sick and safe leave. When I'm in my communities talking about substitute teachers earning sick leave, it's a confusing thing. And it's frustrating for them to hear that people who don't work for me full time uh, will receive pay from me. Uh, and we're using funding that we get to pay for substitute teachers, substitute support staff uh, that don't work for me full time as a result of that bill. So those are a couple things. Uh, we're also subject to the mascot change and um, there's no funding attached to that at this point. And for me, that's over a half a million dollars and I'm not sure where that money is going to come from. You've heard me talk ad nauseum about the cuts that we've been making. And that, that's something that, that we'll have to solve or, or I'm not sure where that's gonna go. Um, so those are three examples of things that are going to affect us and I appreciate that there was some money set aside for the unemployment piece for uh, at least a couple years it looks like, but as a superintendent of the school board, we have to plan for the inevitability. Uh, when that money is gone, I have to have a plan in place for when that's gone. And at this point, that money will have to come from my general fund. And that money will have to come out of classrooms and schools um, and things like that. So those are three examples from, from my perspective. Thank you, um, Superintendent, and just know that we are very vigilant on that unemployment issue and, and um, are looking to the future as well to hopefully not burden the districts with that. Um, uh, and then lastly, we have uh, Superintendent Holmberg. Do you have a, something to say? You know, I, I think uh, the two previous speakers covered, uh, you know, the high points, I think. The one thing that we think about in a school district, for, for Centennial, we're looking at a $1.5, $1.2 million budget reduction adjustment for next year. And so we have, real, that's about 1%. But as we look over the next five years, that's gonna have a cumulative effect as we look at the funding coming in and then implementing training our staff. If we're looking at, um, you know, those types, those are things that we have to plan for and things that we have to look at with the funding sources that are coming in. I think another piece that we just also have to think about as school districts, I don't know if we're different than anybody else, but a lot of the costs for utilities um, have gone up 20 to 30%. You know, and as you look at some of those things that school districts are working with, like any business or any organization, those are real costs that we have to account for as well. And so there's, you know, the READ Act, um, you're in my in the other bill that I'm testifying on behalf of, you'll hear the Unemployment Insurance and Family Medical Leave Act that's coming out. Um, but also, too, those are very real things. Mm -hmm. And without a funding source, those become general fund encumbrances. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Senator Makeway, do you just want to comment on the READ Act? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, actually, I just want to ask questions so that I can be clear. I'm the chief author oh, of the READ Act. I think so let's uh, let Senator Swetinski yes. finish up then. And yes. I'm going to ask you to like make it 30 second answers <laughs> if possible. But if you had brought three classroom teachers, and I know they're busy doing you know teaching right now, but if you were able to bring three current classroom teachers with you, what do you think they would be saying today to us about b budget? potential shortfalls and whatnot, and all the concerns you guys have brought. How is it impacting 
today's current classroom teachers. Thank you. I can jump in if please do, okay. Superintendent. Thank you. Um, number one, uh, just with us, look, we've started having a lot of conversations about class size, you know, and the diversity of the, the, the population of students that we're serving. So class size, but also having the resources and training to be able to implement those tools to make progress for student growth and achievement. And I would say the third thing is, is support. Support for students that have special education needs, gifted and talented needs, because we have students that are coming in with very complex array of, of components that other staff and being able to work collaboratively together to meet the needs of students, it's important. Thank you. Superintendent would, uh, Gross. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I would say that uh, the teachers that I would bring forward would talk about being concerned about whether they're gonna have a job in the fall or not, and how hard and heavy that is to be weighing on their minds every single spring. Uh, it's a terrible environment to put people in. I, it's hard for me as a superintendent who's trying to build a culture of hope, um, fulfillment in this job that, that we know is tough to do, and that um, you know we're trying to retain, retain and attract staff, and every year I have teachers that are worried about whether they're gonna be back in the fall, and that's no way to live, um, it's no way to work, and I think that would be resoundingly what you'd hear from my staff. I appreciate you saying that. I think most of us who were teachers for a long time, remember those first years where we would get that pink slip and with hopes that we'd find something by fall or we'd be called back. Fortunately, that's not always the case these days, and, and that weighs heavy on our mind for sure. All right. Um, oh, Superintendent, or Director, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Kunish. Um, I think if I brought forward um, the most staff where I have, it'd be concerns about the jobs. Um, we unfortunately just voted on the probationary teachers on Tuesday night, which is one of the worst votes you ever have to take as a school board member. Um, and then I'd say um, supports for behavior and, and safety and security of, the, the, of our staff. Um, the, if we're losing the resources that we had with ESSER, how are, we going to, how are we going to replace those resources that we brought in that have been supporting those students? And that's another major gap that we're looking at. So again, any of those, as I said, any of the classroom uh, or student-facing services are really what I'd really want to make sure we focus any additional resources unless it's specifically earmarked, say, for the READ Act. Thank you. Those, are, those last two things are really super important, that support staff, uh, behavior support, and safety and security. So thank you there. Um, uh, Senator Swazinski, are you done? Okay. Um, Senator Mayquaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I'm the chief author of the READ Act, so we're, it's just READ Act 2.0. There's only been one version passed in the law. We're doing number two. But um, because I have you here, I'm just going to ask you questions so we don't have to schedule a meeting and take time out of our busy days. So in this new version, um, we make sure to name that teachers who went through training on the approved training, so letters and, and there's a, a two others, um, in the last five years don't have to go through it because we don't want to retrain teachers who just went through this training. We don't want teachers who are just coming out of um, college and teacher prep programs that were learn structured literacy to have to go back to training. So is five years not enough? Does it need to be more time or is that an appropriate amount of time? Director. For your schools. Yep. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Quaid, for the question and, and John Vento, uh, Robbinsdale. For Robbinsdale, five years would work because it was 19. I would check with Alexandria. Um, because I believe Alexandria was one of the first districts in the state of Minnesota that went down the letters training path. And I'm not positive about that, um, but I believe because that's where we sent our staff when we were evaluating it back then. So they might be, it might miss them. Okay. So I, I just want to not penalize any districts that were yeah. early adopters. So I appreciate the effort on that very much. Uh, and I think, uh, Superintendent Gross, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I, I, I would just echo that comment from the director and, and check with some districts. Um, you know, one of the things we want to make sure of is that the training has fidelity. A lot, these, these trainings and these curriculums aren't established once and run forever. Letters has even changed from five years ago. So um, I think that that investigation uh, work would be really, really important. And we have staff that come and go every year. So, um, but I really appreciate the flexibility with the five years. Thank you. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I appreciate this. This is really helpful. The whole point of this was to stand up something that is long living and not penalize. This is not a, a penalizing uh, bill. It's meant to work with districts. Um, the other part about the curriculum. So I had two questions. The first is um, 
you know, we appropriate money for curriculum, but it doesn't have to be until the 26, 27 school year. Um, so I know some districts are looking at which ones they're gonna purchase, but districts don't have to purchase new curriculum. Um, and they, they don't have to, they, they have to be using structured literacy and there are free uh, curriculums that are on the approved list. Um, but I just wanna make sure that folks know that it is a 2026, 20, 2027 20, timeline. So that we're like, our focus right now, and you'll see this when we release our bill, is that um, it's, it's to get educators trained and to get the right people trained, right? So I think we were a little overly broad in who needs to be trained after that. So we, we narrowed it down to people who work in literacy specifically um, after that third grade level. Um, but the piece I wanted to ask about uh, specifically was, are there any other pieces that you feel like, like the training for all your educators is going to be reimbursed by the state? That is the amount that was appropriated for the professional development um, to the regional centers of lit regional literacy, centers of excellence. Um, that was the purpose of all of those. So are there other pieces that you feel like are coming down the pike that you would want me to be aware of? S Superintendent. Chair Kunish. Um, I, for us, we're, we weren't as progressive as being an early adopter. So any time that we can af you know, afford time for our staff to be able to be trained without taking instructional days away. And I think some districts have looked at that as a mechanism you know, to have students you know, take regular scheduled school days to be able to provide that PD. But if there's more time to be able to, uh, to bring teachers on board with the training, I think it benefits two things. Number one, training doesn't just happen all at one time. Mm -hmm. So to train, reflect, implement, you know, coach, reflect, train again, that aligns with best practice and that would be what I would advocate for. My, um, chair, uh, excuse me, Senator McQuaid. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you for the promotion. Um, we did move out the timeline for training a year. Is that, does that feel like enough or is there more? Look, Superintendent. I, uh, Thank you. Um, I would say uh, yes, a, a year is, is very generous. It'd be nice to get a little more, but uh, we can certainly, with our staff, be able to, to take that into account, especially if we're really prioritizing on literacy staff. Thank you, and Senator Mayquid. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that. Yes, we're looking at the phase one to extend that out, and then there's that phase two, phase three, um, and so it's to make sure that that phase one, most critical, and then they have that more time, because it does take time to go yes. through the training. Um, and we also have expert trainers that have already been through these processes that are ready to support their own colleagues in their district. So I really, really appreciate the feedback, and I'll make sure that you all get the bill so that you can send that to me, because it, again, it's a collaborative effort. There's no punishment that's involved, and we just want to make sure that it works for every district. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Senator uh, Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and before I ask my question, I do want to thank Senator Makewade for working on the READ Act because that was my superintendent's one of their biggest concerns. Um, in fact, when I walked into Hibbing High School, the curriculum director was screaming, Farnsworth, we've got to talk about the READ Act. This is going to bankrupt us. And so first, I want to thank you for, for diligently working on that. Um, but I kind of want to return to a discussion that you weren't here for um, when we were talking about mandates. Um, so we, we talked about the unemployment, and, and a lot of my superintendents have said, hey, yeah, we know this is funded for a couple of years. What happens when it's not funded? And so we've already talked about that. Uh, another concern that, that I've heard from my superintendents is the um, free school lunch. And I won't get into the discussion about whether or not we should do that. We've done it. Um, but that's funded for two years. And I'm just wondering from the folks at the table or, or Mr. Gross, if in two years or three years the state goes into a deficit and we can't afford to fund that at the state level, what would that mean to your school districts if you didn't continue to receive the funding for the free school lunches? Superintendent Gross. Thank you, Madam Chair, and for the question, Senator Farnsworth. Uh, like I, similar to the unemployment piece, an investment was made in free meals, and I'll be the first one to say that no child should worry about where their food, food is. Every kid should eat every day. Um, I'm, I uh, wouldn't apologize for that position. Uh, but an investment was made in that, and what, what's difficult for communities, again, I had a number of people come up to me and say, I'd rather pay for my kids' meals and give money to the schools to be spent on curriculum and teachers because I can pay for my meals. I don't need somebody to pay for my meals for me. That's not true for everybody. Um, but it's an example of an investment was made to pay for meals for people that didn't need that. And as a result, we have less money to put somewhere else. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, if, if districts end up bearing the burden of uh, uh, that cost of, of funding the, or funding the meals, that again will be an, an expense where we're subsidizing our food service program from the general fund. Uh, again, no, no argument to me with me about should kids be eating. I want kids to eat every day. We were feeding kids whether they had m money in their accounts or not. We were doing that. It's important. We all know that. Um, but it would be an additional burden on district's general fund, and that means it would come from kids in classrooms at some point. Thank you. And, and um, there's nothing that's stopping those parents from um, donating to your school district as well. So if they felt that um, they, were, they had the means to pay for their children's lunches and felt that, that was not, there's nothing stopping them from, uh, from you know, dropping that money into your hand and saying use this in the best way possible. So thank you. Uh, any other comments? Our, oh, go ahead. Uh, thank Director. you, Chair Kunish and uh, Senator Farns with a question again, John Venter, Robbinsdale. Um, the scenario you just described is just create another cross subsidy to the general fund. And the one challenge we still in Robbinsdale that we had previous to this was lunch debt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had to take a, hundred, a few years back, our, account, our auditors asked us to take uh, $1 million out of our budget, yeah. out of our general fund to pay for that debt because we can't use nutrition services. So that we still have some lunch debts riding on our nutrition service budget, the fund for, but at the same time, it, it would be devastating because you're, you're just trading one mandate for another. So for paying off the special ed cross subsidy, which I've sat and advocated again for eliminating for years, you just, this universal meals would just create another man, another uh, cross subsidy that would affect our general fund. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Senator Gustafson, author of the bill. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I perked up quite a bit when we brought up universal school meals. I want to first of all say that Minnesota comes in last on funding that. So first of all, you have to be enrolled in the national lunch program through the federal program. That, if you're qualified for that, that all schools have to sign up for that. That money is first. Um, we know the direct certification of students, and that means those who qualify for school lunches has gone up tremendously. I wish I had the stats in front of me. I don't, and I don't want to mess it up, but it has gone up so significantly that it would probably shock most people to, f to find out how many people are directly certified across the state, greater Minnesota, suburbs, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, across the state. So that's one. Two, um, we provided, and I just, uh, you know, we just talked about this as well, this session too, a hold harmless clause, meaning that like the compensatory aid that comes in that you used to get based on what you found out, you know, the forms, the forms that we knew were kind of archaic and weren't working, we held harmless school districts so that they wouldn't lose any of that money. Second of all, last year it was less than 1% of our school budget or our overall education budget. This year, because it is so popular, which is a good thing, which tells us that the, the need was there and now we are um, you know, meeting that need, it is still around 2% of our school budget. As long as I'm here, we will pay for that. I mean, that is something that parents like. It saves them money. Schools like it because they don't have to deal with having lunch debts or this kid has money, this kid doesn't, this kid's hungry, this kid isn't. Teachers like it because up until this year, um, many, many teachers were providing those meals or snacks to students out of their own pocket, and we all know how much teachers do not make. So I think overall, this is good for education. It's a solid policy. It will be funded, um, and it should not be the concern. I, I hear all of the other concerns that came up today, and I this is why I have these two bills in front of you. I believe that as much of our budget as possible should go directly to schools for them to spend on what they need. That might not be something that everybody shares, both you know, in my party and across the aisle, but that's what I think. I think the money should go to schools so that they can properly fund the, the needs that they have. Um, and that's why I'm proud to support these two bills here. But when it comes to universal school meals, that is something that serves everybody that's a stakeholder in our public schools and private schools, because private school students get universal school meals too. But it's about making sure that every kid in Minnesota has a breakfast and a lunch when they're at school, no questions asked. And I think if you were to go and ask parents about it, even those who couldn't afford it, they're saving, at least in White Bear Lake, they're saving about $1,800 a year 
based on universal school meals. So in that way, it's putting money back in the pockets of our community, and that's something everybody promised that they would do. So that's my uh, universal school meals defense, and I will do that forever and ever, put it on my tombstone. <laughs> Okay. Farnsworth, uh, Senator Farnsworth, one more time, and then we've got to move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, you, you made the defense when we passed the bill. We passed the bill, it's law, which is fine. Um, mm -hmm. my, my concern and my superintendent's concern is, yes, this is the right, you know, some of them say this is the right thing to do, but we made a commitment. And there have been cases, like with special education, where the state has not kept their commitment. And so my concern with, with this one in particular, but also the unemployment, is that at some point when the budget gets lean, as it always does, that we're not going to keep the commitment and our schools are going to be left on the hook paying for this. And so that's why I brought it up. And we, and we had the discussion and, and Chair Kunish said, you know, I'd like to hear from those superintendents if they're concerned that if this isn't going to get funded. So I'm like, well, we have an opportunity for her to hear directly from, from our schools that, hey, if you stop funding this, we're in big trouble. Um, you know, for probably, you know, some schools, it's going to be millions of dollars out of their general fund because we didn't accept the amendment that would allow schools to opt out if it's not funded anymore. So I'm glad to hear your commitment to keep it funded um, because that's, it's a commitment that we made. So um, thank you, Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, and just to remind everyone that, that school lunches are and breakfasts are, um, uh, have ongoing um, funding. We aren't expecting to, to take that away unless, uh, some future legislature does that, but uh, I can't imagine that that would look good for them. So thank you anyways. All right, well with that, we are going to lay Senate file 3449 over with a wishful inclusion in our omnibus bill. Thank you very much. You. Yes. Next we have Senator Gustafson's uh, Senate file 4184. If you would like to introduce your bill, and I don't believe you have an amendment. Nope, no amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. So switching over to Senate file 4184, um, this symbolizes the equalization criteria for school districts and creates more equal funding opportunities across schools. This is a significant issue, especially for suburban school districts such as Centennial, White Bear Lake, which I represent um, two school districts in my Senate district, um, but I know all of them would be in support of this. Um, what it does is, um, you know, if, if people, for those who aren't familiar, but it breaks it down so that you are able to, and I want to make sure I get this correct, um, it increases school district's local option revenue authority. So beginning in 2026, it establishes single unspecified equalizing factor applicable to the district's local option revenue. It simplifies the calculation of district's referendum allowance, strikes obsolete language, and provides the full amount of a district referendum revenue. It's potentially eligible for equalization. This is a big deal, and you're going to hear, I'll let my testifier really explain to you what that means for the property owners in our district, but this has bipartisan support. If you represent, especially in Anoka County, and I want to take this opportunity right now to thank Senator Cruin, Senator Abler, who was on the bill, um, Senator Hoffman. Um, in Anoka County, this is something that we have been talking about for a long time, and I know in my district, this is always something that comes up. Um, it is something that our, our you know, our legislature needs to take seriously and take a look at when it comes to funding and how to distribute these funds in a way that doesn't put so much stress on the property owners of our district. So um, with that, I will turn it over to my testifiers. All right, and um, Superintendent, are you going to testify on this one as well? I am, thank Why you. Why don't Chair. you start us off? All right, good morning, Chair Kunish, community members again. My name is Jeff Holmberg, Superintendent of Centennial Schools. And I'm here in support to testify in support of Senate File 4184. Thank you, Senator Gustafson, for introducing the bill, and to Senator Kroon for your partnership on this as well. Um, I represent, as referenced with Anoka County, I, rep I am representing Centennial Schools community, which includes Blaine, Centerville, Circle Pines, Lexington, and Lino Lakes, as well as two partnership organizations, the Association of Metropolitan School Districts, AMSD, and Schools for Equity and Education, C. Uh, we support the proposal to increase the local optional revenue formula. LOR has remained stagnant for the past 10 years since its inception, and we advocate for the increase to the $920. 
The bill also links local optional revenue to the formula to prevent erosion to inflation in the future. Again, this is something we strongly advocate for, aligning future LOR calculations with inflation to provide a consistent and indexed approach that would bring stability and predictability to our budgeting process. Since our community is predominantly residential, tax relief is our top priority, and this bill also promotes greater property tax fairness by increasing the equalizing factor for both local optional revenue and operating referendum. Equalization is paramount to our district, and we strongly support any me measures to reduce the property tax burden on our taxpayers. In Centennial, we do a legislative breakfast and prior to that breakfast, our school board goes through all of the different legislative priorities that would impact our students and our communities. And we create a legislative platform. Equalization is the number one piece for the platform for our school district. Um, and it represents, and it's something that is key critical that would have a positive impact on taxpayer relief as well as providing investment in our students. Secondly, this bill allows school districts to use local optional revenue to be reimbursed for costs related to unemployment compensation and paid family medical leave. Temporary funding for unemployment compensation costs has been provided, but it will be an unfunded mandate, sorry Senator Swadzinski, uh, when the funding runs out. For instance, as an example for this past summer, unemployment insurance costs for our district surpassed $300,000 and we anticipate a further increase in the up upcoming summer of 2025. There, is no curr there currently is no identified funding stream for paid family medical leave, so school districts most likely will use general fund revenue to cover that cost when the program goes into effect. A sustainable funding mechanism is crucial to ensure the continued success of these programs without placing an undue burden on our budget. The provisions of this bill provide this funding mechanism, which would mean approximately $1.4 million to Centennial Schools to offset these ongoing expenses for the district. Again, I extend uh, our, my gratitude for your commitment to addressing these issues, and we look forward to the future of this legislation's positive impact on school districts and communities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, and next at the table, I'm, I'm hoping this is um, Paul Bourgeois. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Director of Finance and Operations for the Minnetonka um, Public Schools. If you would like to state your name for the record, and then you may begin. Thank you, Chair Kunish, Senators. Uh, Paul Bourgeois, uh, Executive Director of Finance and Operations for Minnetonka Public Schools. I'm here to testify on behalf of AMSD, uh, MASBO, School Business Managers, and MREA. Um, this bill is really important. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. Uh, prior testifiers on both the previous bill and this one have gone into a lot of numbers, and I try to uh, do a little bit more uh, metaphorical type of uh, discussion of things because uh, there's plenty of numbers floating around. But the, um, the, the importance of this bill is, um, I, in testifying at the House, I use the metaphor of uh, this, this money would be like a, a person stumbling through the desert finding an oasis. Uh, we are really having a hard time uh, keeping up with uh, inflation. Inflation has been um, uh, something that's just been pounding us. I've used the metaphor of uh, our schools are kind of like Minnesota's fleet and we're fighting the battle of time. We're fighting, we have 13 years to get as much knowledge as we can into every student to try to be able to have them be successful and to be able to power the future economy and reach their dreams and aspirations. And, uh, but we're taking hits. Inflation has been a big torpedo. Uh, it, no money, no mission. Uh, or inflation is just takes a bite out of the, the value of the dollars, as we all know. Um, the the, the uh, mandates for the, they're, they're very good mandates, but uh, they come with a cost. Eventually, the unemployment insurance, and then the uh, uh, paid family medical leave, again, all, all notable um, and, and appropriate. But they are a couple other torpedoes coming at us right now. So we're taking hits in that regard. These dollars would be very, very helpful um, to help s offset some of those costs. The um, Association of Minnesota School Districts uh, it has a survey uh, for their 47 members that there's about $317 million of budget shortfalls uh, that, they're, that we're dealing with right now. And if you put that at $80,000 approximately for a new hire teacher salary and benefits or paraprofessionals, because that's where most of our employees dollars go to, that's where most of our budget dollars go to, our, our general operating fund, you're talking potentially 4,000 4, job losses. You know, that's, that's a big number. 
Uh, so where do we come up with $920? It's, it's something that uh, just simply with the um, um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, you go out on their inflation calculator and you take $424 from when it was implemented in 2014, and that'd be worth, it, it would take about $552 today to, to equal that purchasing power. And then our, th our $300 from, 20, um, from basically 2020 uh, would be about $360. So the combination of those two is about $912. By the time we actually levy this for next year, there'll be some additional inflation. So that's where, in working with uh, uh, people to try to come up with a, a reasonable dollar amount, that's where we came up with it. It's not something that we, we just pulled out of the air. We're just asking to be made whole. We don't have many, uh, in, many funding factors that keep up with inflation. Special ed is its own special animal in that regard. Uh, it has its own inflation factors, but the basic formula increases with inflation. And basic, if you have a referendum that has uh, been approved for inflation, you get that. But that's only about 60% of your revenue. And so all of our other revenues have basically been staying flat. So if there's any way we can get this increase for inflation and then be able to keep up with inflation, it would really be a huge help to every district across the state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Bourgeois. Um, next, we have Brad Lundell and then Shannon Mitchell. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Brad Lundell, Executive Director of Schools for Equity and Education. I want to start out by thanking Senator Gustafson for carrying this bill. Uh, it's very, very important uh, to Schools for Equity and Education. I also want to do a shout out to Scott Kruenquist, who uh, was primary architect of this bill, and really want to thank him for, uh, you know, allowing me today to, you know, chime in. Uh, I'm going to concentrate more on the equalization aspects of the bill. Uh, I've worked on this issue for over 30 years now. And uh, we've seen the equalization formulas that were hatched in the early 1990s basically uh, erode away. And that has created a great disparity in property tax efforts uh, between high property wealth districts and low property wealth districts. Uh, I've, there's a couple of handouts that are in your packet that show that um, the, after the buy down of the general education levy for pay, uh, taxes paid in 2002, uh, the state um, the education levy was about 20% of the net property taxes uh, collected statewide. That's over 30% now, and that's causing disparities. Uh, I think that if you look at, uh, the for paid 2002, the uh, total property taxes uh, for education was about 967 million. It's now 3.5 or 3.6 billion, so that's a two, uh, you know, that's a 280% increase in the property taxes paid for education. Uh, over that same period of time, you know, inflation uh, has been basically about 69 percent, and um, the property wealth difference, uh, you know, the, the difference in terms of the, the growth of the referendum market value has been much, much higher than that. Um, during uh, when, when the local option revenue was uh, created, uh, it was 69 percent levy and 31 percent aid. Now it's over 90 percent levy and uh, less than 10 percent aid. For the referendum, when the referendum equalization peaked in the in 1990s as a percentage of the total collected, it was about 40 percent. Now it's down to about 2 percent of the equalization, the equalization pays for. So you can see the disparities that are happening there. Um, property tax will always be crucial in education funding. There's no question about that. We're seeing that growth. But as we see that growth take place, it has disparate effects in districts because the equalization factors have not kept pace with the property, te property wealth growth. What re uh, Senator Gustafson has done here is, you know, she's put in blanks and everything. We have to figure that out as to what we can afford uh, to do. But really, there has to be massive steps forward in the equalization of the property tax for these levies, or we're going to see, again, continuing disparate uh, effects on low property wealth districts taxpayers in low property wealth districts and taxpayers in higher property wealth districts. Uh, in closing, I would just like to say that there's been a, one of the real problems we've seen over the last decade or so is that the equalization issue sits almost exclusively in this committee. And as you come out and they tell you in the tax committee, you have to come out here with a zero levy target. Um, there has to be greater conjunction between the tax committee and the education committee 
if you're going to solve this issue. The education, total education levy is probably going to surpass counties as the highest levy, the highest jurisdiction. And somehow the tax committee says, no, no, the education, you have to solve this. That has to end if you're going to solve this issue. There has to be greater cooperation between these committees. I would go even one step further and say that uh, the executive branch probably needs to look at a target for all the jurisdictions and figure out what the tax, juris tax incidence is across all these jurisdictions and come up with a way to make sure that the property taxes are uh, applied fairly. Equalization of property tax, uh, school property taxes is a clear uh, way of making sure that the property tax incidence across all jurisdictions is applied more fairly. But I think one of the issues, again, I've seen, and you know, having been around this business a long time, one of the real problems I've seen is that this committee is always, you know, you have to have a zero levy target. And that ends the conversation when it comes to equalization. It just does. And so there has to be a greater investment by the tax committee if this is going to move forward. So again, I thank Senator Gustafson. I thank this committee. I thank all of you for, uh, for listening today and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Oops. Thank you so much, Director Lindell. Um, and then Shannon Mitchell. Here she is. Thank you, Chair Kunish, members. My name is Shannon Mitchell, and I'm the Public Policy and Advocacy Director for the Minnesota Association of Charter Schools. Senate File 4184 is critical to addressing an issue that you've already heard a lot about. Um, it provides traditional school districts with a lifeline to combat the cost of unemployment and paid leave programs. This bill is extremely timely, as school leaders have already outlined their concerns that these costs are only going to continue to rise. The Minnesota Association of Charter Schools supports creating funding streams to address these um, expenses, but would respectfully ask that charter schools also be included. As it currently stands, charter schools would be left out. Like traditional district schools, charter schools are facing extremely challenging financial situations and as a result, decisions. And this is in no small part because of the unemployment and paid family leave programs. And while these programs are very important, so is fully funding schools' abilities to cover these uh, program costs alongside continuing to provide quality instruction. Um, this Senate file seeks to allevi alleviate the, some of these program costs for traditional districts by increasing the local optional revenue funding. Um, but we would urge the chair and committee members to consider ways to also include public charter schools since they do not receive local optional revenue funding um, or any levy funding from property taxes. So we look forward to continuing this conversation um, with everybody and thank you uh, chair and members for your time. Thank you, Director Mitchell. Anyone else wanting to testify on this? No? Nope. All right, members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, um, Senator Gustafson, if you would like to do your final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's been great talking about these two bills and the funding that's necessary. Again, um, you know, schools have no choice. If they were businesses, they could raise the cost of their products or services, or they could find other ways to be inventive. But our public schools come to us just begging for money. And I think that we need to keep hearing bills like this so we could find out exactly um, where, where the money's going, how it's being used, what we can do better, where we can fund more. Um, again, I wanna thank uh, my partners across the aisle who also joined me in this um, equalization issue because it does affect a lot of us um, and it doesn't seem to be um, th this seems to be a real chance of a bipartisan path forward in education. And um, I think the runs for the schools are concluded in your packets, but if not, um, I can always get those to any member who is interested. Um, I can get those to you offline, but um, thank you for considering this. And thank you for the time. Thank you for the really robust, um, helpful conversations that you brought to our conference this morning. These are things that are not new to any of us, and um, sometimes we need to hear it time and time again and continue to work on these, and thank you for um, allowing us to do that. So with that, Senate File 4184 is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you.
We're going to mix things up a little bit. Uh, Senator uh, Hochschild is still in another committee, so I'm going to do my Senate file 5256 really quick. Whenever you're ready, Senator, um, welcome to the, well, welcome to your committee. Mm -hmm. We'll be laying over Senate File 5256 for possible inclusion in the future omnibus bill. Um, begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair, for taking over for me. So what this bill does is it authorizes money from the school food service fund to be used for the cost of lunchroom furniture. Um, and this came from a conversation I had with the superintendent to the left of me, and she mentioned that they had a surplus uh, in their food budget, their um, school food service fund, and wished that they could use it to update tables and chairs and those sort of things in their lunchrooms. So currently, lunchroom furniture is left out of the list of items that can be charged to the fund, which means that the school has to find money to pay for lunchroom furniture elsewhere. In this bill, lunchroom furniture is defined as tables and chairs regularly used by pupils in a lunchroom from which they may consume milk, meals, or snacks in connection with school or community service activities. The small size of tables and small amount of tables in the class in a lunchroom adds unnecessary stress to students. Students worry about whether they will or will not get a seat at the lunch table, and, and if they do, if that seat will be with their friends. I think we've all been there where we jockey for just that right spot. Um, furthermore, once the students are at the table, they often have to fight for arm and leg room. Uh, under physical well-being, inadequate school furniture is a contributing factor to the onset of, this is a really interesting study, you guys, um, a contributing factor to the onset of muscul musculoskeletal pain in students. I don't know if any of you knew that. There are negative um, consequences of inadequate school furniture. One study found that within a, a sample of children six to eight years old, 58% of them took time off at least once a month due to pain associated with the discomfort caused by the length of time sitting in a sitting position. Uh, providing schools with the ability to purchase adequate, comfortable furniture for their students will make students more physically comfortable at school. And um, so with that, I have a couple of testifiers. Thank you. And the two testifiers are Mandy Fletcher and Jeremy Schmidt. Whenever you're ready, identify yourself for the record. Make sure you sign in on the um, log. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Senator Kunish, for introducing Senate File 5256. I am Mandy Fletcher, Superintendent of Blue Earth Area Schools. I'm here today to speak to this bill, which is the result of a conversation I had with Senator Kunish. A couple weeks ago, I had the pleasure of meeting with Senator Kunish to discuss some important topics as it pertains to schools and financing. One of the items I shared with Senator Kunish was our increasing fund balance in our food service fund. Historically, it has been the hope of the Minnesota Department of Education that schools carry no more then three months worth of expenses in this fund to encourage investing in the food service program and kitchen equipment. Since the pandemic created unusual circumstances that resulted in higher reimbursement rates for school meals, many schools, including Blue Earth Area, saw larger increases in their food service fund, and as such, MDE increased their allowable amount in this fund to six months worth of expenses before schools need to submit a spend down plan. The challenge for schools to spend down this fund balance comes due to the restrictions on what can be purchased using dollars from the food service fund. Under current state statute, schools are not able to purchase cafeteria tables using food service funds, for example. For Blue Earth Area, 
We have historically had a healthy food service fund balance, but in the last few years, it has grown even healthier to approximately 2.5 times the amount of our historical average, which is great news. But again, the challenge to spend it down becomes greater when there are so many restrictions on what this fund can be spent on. When I spoke with Senator Kunish, I shared that by expanding the allowable uses of the food service funds, schools could utilize these dollars to purchase much needed lunchroom furniture without impacting the general fund, which also means it would not cost the state additional money. As such, I appreciate Senator Kunish hearing our concerns and proposing this bill that would expand the allowable uses of the food service fund to include lunchroom furniture and express my support of this bill. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kunish, thank you for bringing this bill forward as well. Uh, my name is Jeremy Schmidt. I'm the superintendent at Becker Public Schools. Today I'm testifying on behalf of school districts who rely on the school food service fund to support feeding our students. I've got a little bit different story than, than Blue Earth. Um, we do have a, a decent fund balance in our fund two food service fund. Um, and I do wanna thank, I guess first of all, thank you for providing the, the school meals for students. Um, I'm here to ask for support of the expansion of the food, Senate file 5256 uh, to further benefit the delivery of the food service program to our students. As educators, policymakers, parents, we all know that how important it is to that nutrition plays. We've got some statistics here that uh, Senator Kuhn has shared as well about better concentration, overall well-being of our students. At Becker Public Schools, we have seen uh, an incredible increase in our lunches over our averages. Uh, I mean, going back to the pre-pandemic time when we had school meals for all, um, but we have a 15% increase in our primary school, which is uh, K-12 or K-2, 17% in our intermediate school, 23% increase in, in students served in our middle school of sixth through eighth grade, and 21% higher uh, food service in our high school, uh, which is about 19% average throughout our school district. We have 19% more students eating school lunches than we did prior to the pandemic. And again, I think that's thanks to the, the free school meals. However, this, this uh, increase has created some constraints on what was already a, an overwhelming, um, overwhelmed system. The, the food service department is, is it's packed and uh, it runs very efficiently. Imagine getting four or 500 kids through a, a meal uh, lunchtime for about an hour and a half, two hours of time. You gotta get all those kids through the lunch line. Um, what I'm asking for is is the expansion for this to allow us to make renovations and upgrade some of the, the efficiency of the food service cafeteria areas for, for helping to, us to get through more students in the lines. Uh, by modernizing our facilities, we can streamline operations, accommodate these growing student meal numbers, and create environments that help healthy eating habits and social interaction. I would ask uh, to include renovations and remodeling aimed at increasing this efficiency in student dining areas, along with the, the tables and, and, and things as well that are not included. Uh, and then in conclusion, I just ask for your support of this Senate file 5256, uh, recognizing its potential to revolutionize our school food service programs. And uh, I wanna thank you for your attention. I can answer any questions as well. Thank you for your testimony. Members, questions, comments? I, I have a question for, for the, um, the superintendent next to me. When you talk about um, modernization of dining areas for renovations and efficiency, how would you imagine that to look for either just a specific school or across your district? Like, Give us some ex examples of what that might look like. Oh, well, an example maybe in, in our school district would be our intermediate school, for example, has a, a coat area that is, uh, has a wall that's between um, where there's a storage area for kids to put their coats and boots and things like that. And it's, it creates a smaller cafeteria size. Mm -hmm. And instead of us passing a bond referendum or something like that, where we just increase the entire cafeteria size, I think being able to take that wall down and using some of this money to help, help do that. Or maybe some of the service lines, some of the areas we have in our, uh, in our kitchen, kitchen area, not the eating area, but where we provide the food and serve the food, uh, those are very tight. So we don't even have enough room in some of our kitchens where we can add staff members because of this increase uh, of students coming through, where we'd like to be able to try to figure out a way to reconfigure that and, and maybe move some walls around or you know, get a more efficient cooler where it's smaller or things like that. Um, I think that would be very helpful for us to, to be able to do. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Kunish, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I think it's, uh, first of all, it's wonderful news to hear that any the district anywhere has a surplus of in some area or another. So music to our ears here and um, the, the ability to use that money to solve the problems that you, you're, you're finding with the, um, with the um, um, increase of students that are eating and lunches. And um, I've always been blown away by the efficiency of our of our school lunch programs to feed, you know, 800 kids or 2,000 or whatever the numbers are in your districts in that window of an hour and a half to two hours. It's, it's something to be holding once in your life. So, Senator Kunish, any final comments? Nope, I just ask that um, we support this bill in the best way possible. Okay, and this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Mayquaid, for joining us at the table. Um, we'll be hearing Senate File 4192, and I believe you have an A1 amendment. Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to move the A1 amendment. Okay. Do you want to speak to that at all? Um, it's an author's amendment, but it just uh, inserts some language to um, allow for the realities of ways that districts uh, choose their school-age child care populations Got so it. that they have that flexibility. Yeah. All right. Um, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The A1 passes. And Senator, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, um, before you, Senate File 4192, which would require that school districts, to the extent practicable, give highest priority to applications for school-age care programs for children placed in foster care. One of the most traumatic experiences for a child is the removal from their home and placement into the foster care system. If a child is placed with a foster family and regains some stability in their life, it is critical that we do what we can to provide support to that child and their family. This bill will ensure that foster parents are able to access school-age care for their children and provide that stability and support for one of our most vulnerable populations. This bill came to me from the uh, chief author in the other body, Representative Mary Frances Clardy, who heard stories where children were at risk of being removed from their foster home due to the foster parents' inability to access much needed childcare. This bill will be a crucial step in ensuring children are able to remain with one family rather than being moved from home to home. And uh, my amendment addresses the concern, the, um, the concerns that were brought to me about the bill and also ensures that integrity intent of the bill is remaining, and I want to thank um, my co-authors on this bill. It is a bipartisan bill uh, for joining me. It is permissive in whether districts uh, are going to levy for this type of aid, but if they are having school-age child care um, admissions, they do have to give highest priority to foster students, and that is my bill, Madam Chair. <laughs> I have a Dayquil haze today. Any, uh, anyone out there would like to testify to this bill? Oh. Members, do you have any questions for Senator May Quaid? All right, well with that, um, consider Senate File 4192 to be laid over po for possible inclusion as amended. Thank you, Madam um, I think um, we need to, we're gonna wait for Senator Hostchild to finish up over in his next in his uh, hearing next door. So we're just gonna take a quick five minute recess and then um, hopefully he will be back and join us to present Senate file 3790. Yeah, members, please don't leave the, the room. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, recess is over, and so we are going to get back in, yeah, go back to class, uh, take your seats, and uh, we'll expect Senator Hauschild here any moment. Okay, members, um, I don't know where Senator Hauschild is. Maybe they kept him a little bit longer, but I'm going to ask Senator Mayquay just to start us off and get us going. I know there's lots of people here, and if, if that mother needs somebody to hold her baby, uh, you can bring that baby right up here. <laughs> and then gavel us in. Okay, Senator um, uh, Mayquaid, if you would like to just begin to introduce Senate File 3790, and then when Senator Hostel gets here, we'll let him take over. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, thank you for agreeing to hear Senate File 3790. Uh, Senate File 3790 creates the Great Start Affordability Scholarship Program to help families with children under the age of five afford childcare. Scholarships will be available to families who are making less than 150% of the state medium income, which is about 174,000 for a family of four, who are not already receiving um, other early learning uh, money. Um, the language in the bill um, uh, requires MDE to establish a system of making scholarship payments to early care and learning programs that um, make early care and learning programs eligible if they participate in the Parent Aware Program. Um, includes a written agreement between a program and a family that identifies a scholarship as a state-provided benefit. It pays that child care provider prospectively. It makes payments based on a child's enrollment and includes a process for transferring the scholarship awards between early care and learning programs when initiated by the recipient and requires payments to start no later than September 1 of 2024. Um, <clears throat> The last thing I just want to say is uh, child care, actually Senator Housechild will say it so much better than I do. He has two, and I have one. Come on, Ms. Senator Housechild. Mm -hmm. 
welcome to the committee, Senator Hauschild. I'm got to shift your brain, I'm sure, a little bit. Um, but uh, let's hear what you have to say about Senate File 3790. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm, are we at the beginning of the bill? Yep, or, okay. We're just okay, doing thank some you introduction. for that clarification. Um, today I have for your consideration Senate File 3790. This bill helps create the Great Start Affordability Scholarship Program to help families with children under the age of five afford childcare. One of the biggest and most burdensome costs for families in every single part of our state is childcare. The childcare affordability crisis affects all Minnesotans through family insecurity, lost earnings and productivity and economic inefficiencies. The Great Start Affordability Scholarship would be available for families making less than 150% of the state median income who are not receiving other childcare assistance or an early learning scholarship. This bill builds on the existing infrastructure of childcare businesses across the state by distributing payments to childcare providers directly based on the incomes of families. This ensures that no family, Minnesota family pays more than 7% of their annual income on childcare, helping 85% of families with young children. With that, uh, Chair Kunish and committee members, I do have um, two testifiers, as well as maybe some on Zoom as well. Thank you, Senator Hauschild. I actually have six folks that would like okay. to speak to this. So it's a, it's a really important topic, and I, I'm um, really interested in hearing from folks. Jill Wessendorp, you um, are first on my list, and then Robert Hader as well, if you'd like to. Oh, who's... Yeah. Do you want to come up and testify? Let's give you priority. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I don't know your name, but when you sit down, go ahead and introduce yourself and your darling da uh, child, and we'll begin. <coughs> Good morning, Chair Kunish and members of the committee. My name is Laura Delventhal. Um, I am a mother of three children. I'm also a parent leader with Kids Count on Us. Um, whenever legislation that impacts children is being discussed, I believe children should be in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I am here with Kit, my five-month-old, and because it's spring break for our school district, my eight-year-old Dakota and my five-year-old Mika. Uh, my spouse and I live in South Minneapolis, and we feel really fortunate to be in the middle class. Um, but the reality is that the middle class can no longer comfortably afford their lives. My husband's company does not offer health insurance, so we purchase ours on the exchange um, at a premium of more than $1,800 per month. And that's, that's over $21,000 per year just to have health insurance. And yet that is uh, only about half of what our childcare expenses were when my two oldest were both in childcare. We paid over $39,000 per year, which is a far cry from Minnesota's stated goal of no more than 7% of a family's income, which is why I am speaking in support of passing SF 3790 and lowering the cost of child care for families. At that time, uh, I was working as the education manager at Children's Theater Company. I felt fortunate and successful in that position, but I was essentially paying mm. to go to work. Uh, because my take-home pay was less than the cost of childcare. I was regularly told, it's worth it, you're building a career. Uh, as a society, we are using building a career as another excuse not to publicly fund childcare. It's not okay. Parents, especially working moms, deserve better. I ultimately chose to leave the full-time workforce in no small part due to the cost of childcare. I participate I anticipate that I will continue to piece together various part-time jobs until Kit is 18 months old when she can start childcare as a toddler, which is at least less expensive. I don't imagine that I will make much more money than it will cost. I don't imagine I will make much more money than will cover the cost of childcare, however. If SF3790 were passed, it would change my plan entirely. I could afford to make choices based on the career I want for myself and on the needs of my child. It is deeply important to me that my kids and all kids have access to early childhood learning. It should be as deeply important to our collective society that all of our youngest children have high quality early learning experiences. Childcare is education. Every bit of data shows us that our biggest national resource is our people, and every piece of data shows us that the best time to invest in our people is when their brains are rapidly developing between zero and five. This bill is a great first step in following that data and making Minnesota a great state to raise a family. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for bringing your children in and reminding us of the work that we do are really centered on, on the children. And I, I do believe that uh, our children 
you know, are the center of the work that we do. And so thank you and um, thank you to your daughters for being such good little um, patient participants. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next, uh, Jill Wessendorp. Good morning, Chair Kunish, members of the committee. My name is Jill Westendorp, and I'm speaking as part of Take Action Minnesota's Parents and Caregivers United, organizing for Minnesota families. Thank you for hearing me. I urge you to support the Great Start Affordability Program. The high cost of childcare impacts virtually all Minnesota parents. Many families find themselves choosing between daycare they cannot afford and losing income in order to care for their children. The burden this puts on families has profound social and economic impacts on our state. For my own family, quitting my job made the most sense. My husband had been working from home full time while caring for our infant while I was at work. This was unsustainable. And so when my daughter Ramona was eight months old, I left my career to become a 24 seven caregiver. My husband took on more work to make up for our lost income often working up to 90 hours a week to provide for our family. I felt isolated and drained every day. My husband missed precious time with his child. We were both perpetually stressed and exhausted. Neither of us could be the energetic, fully present parents we wanted to be and our child deserved. My family's experience is not unique. I shared my story with the House Committee in February. It felt good to be heard, and I was hopeful that this fundamental issue would be addressed in the proposed budget. I was disheartened and frustrated to learn last week that no money was allocated to affordable child care scholarships, despite a surplus that would allow us to fully fund this program while protecting a balanced budget into the future. We cannot afford not to invest in Minnesota children. The first four years of life are critical for social, emotional, and cognitive development. I urge you to honor the stories of families like mine, address the impact of child care costs on our state, and fully fund the Great Start Affordability Program. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, next, Robert Hader, and then we will go with Karen DeVos. If you would please state your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Robert Heider, and I am the Legislative Director at Take Action Minnesota. We are a grassroots, multiracial people's organization that believes in a democracy and government that works for us all. With our members, we advocate for policies that promote justice and fairness. On behalf of our members, who have told us in overwhelming numbers that child care affordability is the most important issue in their lives, I'd like to thank the authors of this bill for their leadership and urge this committee to fund the program included in Senate File 3790. Whether it's in the seven county metro area or in communities across greater Minnesota, like those represented by the bill's author, Senator Hoschild, child care affordability has an outsized impact on families. In a recent survey of parents in our membership base, 87% told us that they struggle with costs, 90% have exp experienced increased stress, a third have sacrificed paying for basic needs like food and rent, and 0% have the rest and relaxation that they need and we all deserve. Further, we've heard countless stories from parents who want to have another child but cannot due to the prohibitive costs of childcare. So while we're disappointed that funding for the program was not included in the budget targets, we're encouraged that childcare affordability has been identified as an issue that must be addressed. I'll close today with a quote from one of our members who said, we settle for childcare that isn't neglectful, but it isn't what we would like because we can't afford the nice daycare centers. We find that sentiment unacceptable and hope that you do as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Heider. Uh, next, uh, Karen DeVos, and then we'll go with Erica Moss. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Karen DeVos. I am the owner and director of Little Learners Early Childhood Centers, located in the Northwestern rural communities of Ada and Halstead, Minnesota. Both sites, the only two center-based care options in Norman County, are four-star parent-aware rated. Both sites are located on campuses of and have partnerships with the local nursing home, providing a unique opportunity for intergenerational experiences and longer hours that better accommodate those working in the elder care field. 
Both sites have five day a week preschool programs, ensuring that our children are kindergarten ready. I've been in this field for 29 years. I opened my family childcare business at the age of 22 in what my husband and I considered our starter home. Childcare affordability for families was an issue then. Because of that, I've done everything possible to keep our rates low for families, knowing that if I charged the actual cost of care, families would need to make the difficult choice to likely have one parent, probably the mother, leave the workforce. Little Learners serves a large number of children who utilize childcare assistance and early learning scholarships. I am extremely grateful for the forward thinking of our, of our legislature who moved these programs into a space where we can actually afford to care for children on scholarships and CCAP. However, that doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't tell the story of the family where one parent is an educator in our local K-12 system and the other parent works for the city. They have two children. One was born with spina bifida. They make too much to qualify for CCAP or scholarships, but their medical expenses and unpaid work time due to medical appointments eat up their extra income. Often they need to rely on their own parents to help with childcare expenses, or they end up charging the expense to a credit card. It also doesn't tell the story of another family who barely make over the $60,000 threshold, both parents working full time, three children in care and mom's entire paycheck goes to childcare. Mom could quit her job, but then she would find herself years behind in her field and likely not able to get back into the position that she currently holds because those jobs don't often open up in small rural communities. These are the common stories of our middle income families. This is why I am here today. I'm so thankful for what we have done for our low income families in Minnesota, but it's time that we look at the whole picture. This bill, if implemented and funded in its entirety, would help 85% of Minnesota families, ensuring that no family pays over 7% of their income for childcare. Additionally, by providing prospective payments and paying on enrollment versus attendance, small centers like mine would be able to budget more effectively, thus stabilizing our business. I'm 29 years in the field. I've grown my small family childcare business into two early childhood education centers caring for 110 children, staffing 25 full and part-time employees. My husband and I still live in our starter home. I have never made more than him. I'm 29 years in this field and I have never made what would be considered a living wage. The Great Start Affordability Scholarship not only helps our middle-income families afford early care and education for their young children, it also supports the workforce by allowing early educators to provide care at the true cost, which will in turn increase wages and bring us another step closer to stabilizing the field. This is an education issue. This is a workforce issue. This is a family issue. It is a community issue. And in many ways, this is a woman issue. And this is why I support Senate file 3790. Thank you. Thank you so much, DeVos, and thank Ms. DeVos, and thank you so much for your dedication to caring for um, our very youngest uh, community members. We do appreciate it. All right, next we have Erica Moss. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you. My name is Erica Moss, and I work for Think Small. We refer to ourselves proudly as leaders in early learning, and our work covers multiple facets, including administering early learning scholarships and the parent aware ratings in the metro area. I'm here today speaking in support of Senate File 3790, which we view as critically important to our highest strategic priority, all children ready for kindergarten. Specifically, we regularly see families narrowly miss eligibility for early learning scholarships. One parent, Daniel Rogge, a letter from him is in your packets, um, wrote about his experience in the Star Tribune saying, a few thousand dollars, that is what stands between my younger son having the early education he deserves in a quality childcare and me having enough money in my budget to make ends meet. He goes on to say that it isn't right that Minnesota has a system that only helps people once they reach poverty, but won't help them stay out of poverty. Simply put, all children cannot be ready for kindergarten if the burden for financing their early education falls on parents too cash strapped to pay for the opportunity. Senate file 3790 addresses the current funding cliff and brings much needed help. Um, the proposal builds on the successful early learning scholarship program. The bill includes a key policy change from existing programs by increasing income eligibility to 150% of state median income, which um, 
as a previous testifier mentioned, would help about 86% of families with young children. And the p bill also includes key policy changes from existing programs, which, ha which would have the state paying providers prospectively in advance of service each month and paying based on enrollment rather than attendance, just as private pay families do now. This aspect of the proposal borrows best practice from our neighbor, North Dakota, and is aimed squarely at strengthening and stabilizing our home and center-based child care pro programs, which continue to struggle, excuse me, post-COVID. We are excited about this proposal and look forward to partnering with the authors to help get help to families as soon as possible. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then we have um, Deborah Messenger, if you would like to... Um, unmute yourself and state your name for the record and you may begin. Good morning, Chair Kanish, the members of the committee. My name is Deborah Messenger and I am the director of All Ages and Faces <coughs> Academy and a leader with Kids Count on Us. There are moments when silence is very welcome and then there are moments when silence is deafening, like the silence of a parent who has called to ask about childcare and when I tell them the cost. It's heartbreaking to have a mom who is excited to have found childcare at all, realizes she'll have to decline her new job offer because she cannot afford childcare. It is expensive to provide high quality childcare for all of the reasons it's expensive to provide high quality public education for K through 12. We need space, we need materials, we need teachers, we need insurance, we need heat, we need electricity. It all adds up. When we charge our families the lowest amount possible that we can to pay our bills, but the lowest amount that we can charge families is still far more than families can afford, which is why SF3790 is so important. Offering a service at a price families cannot afford is not a good business model. This bill will help families afford childcare at our center, which means more kids at our center, which is what we need to stay open. Every unfilled spot puts us in a more precarious financial position. It's like an airplane. The airplane leaves makes the most money when the airplane is full. When there are fewer passengers on the flight, the airplane makes less money, but airlines have wiggle room while child care centers do not. As parents leave the workforce and drop out of child care, our plane gets closer and closer to not being able to take off. Child care centers close because they cannot afford to stay open. By helping families with child care costs, like this bill does, you are ensuring that child care centers are getting the resources they need to remain open and provide high quality care to more children which benefits us all. I urge you to pass this bill, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Messenger, and uh, for your dedication as well to providing those services to our, our youngest and to the family support that you provide. Um, are there any other testifiers out there that would like to comment or ask question? Members, anybody? Uh, Senator um, Wesley. Senator, what's her name? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, this is such an important bill. Um, and as someone who was a single parent most of my adult life, um, and at one point trying to build a law practice, uh, the cost of child care is, is just debilitating. And for people who are single parents who don't have the option of having a spouse stay at home to care for the child, it is even more so. Um, we have a workforce shortage, we, ha we have all kinds of issues, and uh, um, when, we, when, we look, when we pull back and look at the entire system, um, certainly being able to provide affordable, quality child care for kids so that parents can enter the workforce uh, is really critically important, and um, I do hope that somewhere along the way we prioritize this and 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 find a way to fund this for families. 
We have workforce shortages that are not helped by people who have to remain out of the workforce because of the cost of child care. But um, it, uh, I lived this for, for many years, and I will tell you the day that my son no longer had to be in the before and after school program uh, was the lifting of a huge load and a huge burden. Uh, so we, we should do what we can to help families and overall help our economy. Thank you, Senator Westland. Anybody else? Well, I think um, our test fires really nailed a lot of it, but I think what's really important is to look at the, almost to the future and see how we are best enabling those families with children to be active participants in our community. If anybody knows me, they know I have these two little sweet granddaughters that, um, that I love to spend time with, and Fridays um, I provide that, that daycare day for, for both of them, and it's you know my pleasure to do that. But if uh, I wasn't doing that, and if the other grandparents weren't covering on Mondays, uh, the, the burden of, of childcare is astronomical. And I, I, I remember when we figured out how much it would cost between those two girls, um, the savings that we were providing for that family, our daughters, um, it was really, it, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, and uh, it's not gonna get any better. Um, we don't want to undercharge or underestimate the cost of doing business, as, as uh, Ms. Messenger said, for our child care providers. And I was a child care provider for about five years in my home. Um, so I understand the, the cost and the, the um, issues that surround that. And so I think this is a really important issue that we ought to continue to consider. And uh, Senator Mayquaid, you have a, a young a young daughter yourself, I can only imagine um, how personal this is to you, but uh, it's an extraordinary cost to, to the state, but I think it's a good investment. So if there's nothing else, final words, Senator Mayquaid. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and, and members, and thank you to all the testifiers who came to share their stories. I think yeah, I, I do have a child, she's not even two yet, and this is something I've cared about for a lot longer than I've had a child for, but it is, um, it, it is different when half of this legislative salary pays for daycare. That is, that is how much daycare costs. It's fully 50% of our legislative salary. Um, and, and the care my daughter receives is amazing. And yet, that's too, 50% is too much. Um, and so every family should be able to afford quality early learning for their children so that they can participate in the workforce, that their children get the experience of early learning. And we are the country that invests the least in our youngest. And we can do more. If yeah. we want to be the best country, we got to do the best stuff. Yeah. And this will put Minnesota nation leading. And so I appreciate the time today and appreciate Senator Housechild's really hard work and all the advocates because this is just vitally important work. Thank you, Senator Mayquaid. Um, so that with that, Senate file 3790 will be laid over for possible inclusion. I do want to do a quick shout out to school librarians. Today is National School Librarian Day. So please, uh, any of those librarians that you know uh, that service our kids, that work in our schools, um, please send them a message or a shout out or somehow show your appreciation. And with that, we are adjourned.